And in this section of the webinar, we're looking at the children, really looking at the children's book publishing industry in the company of Rachel Rooney, author of My Body Is Me, and Millie Hill, author of My Period. Um, but first, we're going to watch a short video by Phoebe Rose, who wrote and illustrated the book Sex and Gender. And she's going to tell us um, about her book and why it was necessary for her to publish under a pseudonym. Phoebe's situation is just a reminder of the real risks people face in writing anything that challenges the idea of gender identity, and particularly, and I think shamefully, in the children's book publishing industry. Um, so let's watch um, Phoebe speak about her book. Hi, I'm Phoebe Rose. This is a pseudonym taken from a family name and the name of a dear friend, Rose, who helped me knock about ideas while writing this book. Although I speak out locally, I can't at present speak out publicly. I'm a teacher and wrote this book for all children, but in particular children who are autistic, potentially LGB or non-conforming because they are most at risk from this ideology. Gender ideology activists use sex and gender interchangeably and say that they are smashing the binary. But sex is binary. So this makes no sense and confuses children. These activists also say that male equals masculine and female equals feminine. And most children don't fit neatly into a masculine or feminine stereotype. This can leave children feeling that something is wrong with them. And these are the messages that are currently being given in schools to the youngest children through picture books, fiction and even graphic novels. My book follows some teenagers who explore what sex and gender mean in a sort of comic style. I wanted to make the difference between sex and gender clear. A boy is male and a girl is female. It's important to include a page on DSDs, also known as intersex conditions, because this is often used to claim that sex is a spectrum, although we know that it is not. I got professional help to give the correct information. Here we can see that characters also discuss sex-based definitions of sexual orientation, such as lesbian, gay, heterosexual and bisexual. Here we can see characters find the definition of gender online, where they realise that gender is just sexist stereotypes, with one character in particular feeling that there is nothing wrong with her. The problem was just sexist stereotypes all along. They discuss the feeling of being put in a box and how they didn't want to be boxed in and celebrate that they are all unique with their own personalities. The book ends with them talking about their hobbies and little biographies so that all the children will find something or someone that they can relate to. Feedback has been really positive. Maud, 12, says, My aunt got me this book and I really enjoyed reading it. It clearly explains what sex and gender are and the difference between the two. It does this with lots of different characters and cool drawings. If I could change anything, I would ask for more. And from parents, if you haven't already got your daughter this, I'd highly recommend it. I bought it for mine. She devoured it and gave it five stars. She said it explains so much that I'd started to talk to her about. And I found it in my son's school bag. He's 13. And I asked him why it was there. He said he wanted to show it to his friends. We found that it's been a great conversation starter, but also great just for planting seeds. One mother was so relieved to tell me that months later after her daughter had read this book, her child had mused, you know gender, it's just made up. We're so grateful to Phoebe Rose for producing that book for us with her enormous talent both with the words and her illustrations. Uh, it's a really beautiful book. And one of the reasons, um, and we had a lot of demand from parents for alternative books. And, uh, you know, I have a collection of um, books. The, the, the amount of books being produced for early years, primary, all telling children they might be the opposite sex, if they like the wrong things, um, they have the wrong interests. So um, I, ha I have a huge collection. I like to do my research. Um, so again, producing alternatives for children that really gives them facts about the difference between sex and gender um, is really um, important right now. 
Um, and the feedback to um, the book Sex and Gender has been just overwhelming how necessary this book is now. And it leads us nicely into our next two authors. Um, Rachel Rooney is a trained teacher in both primary and special education with a particular interest in autism. And she's an award-winning children's poet, one of our top children's poets in this country with four poetry collections and a number of rhyming picture books to her name. All of her books are wonderful. I'd really um, encourage you to, to seek them out. Uh, she was long listed for the Kanji Medal and is winner of the Clipper Award for the Language of Cat, and she's winner of the North Somerset Book Award for A Kid in My Class. It's a wonderful book. Uh, and she wrote My Body Is Me, illustrated by Jessica Olberg, um, for Transgender Trend in 2019, and it continues to fly off the shelves three years later. Uh, Millie Hill is a freelance journalist and the author of three books about women's health, the Positive Birth Book, Give Birth Like a Feminist, and her latest book, My Period, Find Your Flow and Feel Proud of Your Period, um, which was published this year. Um, so I want to go to you first, Rachel, and your experience um, and, and ask you the same question, really. What, what brought you to writing My Body Is Me? Why did you think it was important to write it and put it out? Well, I didn't intend to write a, um, a picture book about this issue, but uh, I got an email from Jessica Allberg in 2018, uh, out of the blue, asking me whether I wanted to collaborate on, on a book. And uh, of course, Jessica is an amazing illustrator and she comes from the wonderful Allberg dynasty, who I'm very fond of. So for that reason alone, I was interested, but also because um, I'd seen an influx of books from since, say, 20. 15 of um, not just YA books and middle grade books, but picture books aimed at the youngest audience. And I've been looking at some of those books and I wasn't particularly impressed with what I saw on a, on a purely literary level. Uh, they tend to be rather formulaic and uh, sanitized and they uh, obviously reinforce sex stereotypes and, and the language is often quite leaden and um, didactic so not, not particularly inspiring but I was more concerned with the message that they were sending you know um, telling very very young children that that children who uh, you know inhabit their bodies fully who learn through their bodies uh, who are just understanding their bodies that they they may be born in the wrong body and that they have this innate gendered soul that is somehow misaligned with um, you know, with who they are, and that the actual essence of them is wrong. Uh, and so it, they, it kind of pushes the idea, not just of a tra trans child, which, which I take issue with, but a trans toddler, you know? Um, so these books, you know, uh, they're telling very young children who are at an age where their understanding of fantasy and reality is really blurred that they, that, what is a fiction is a fact. And um, children don't really understand what they, they haven't got the cognitive ability to understand what, what they might be signing up to. So I'm particularly concerned about social transition and what happens before they get to the gender identity clinics, clinics. You know, what are we doing at that base level that kind of results in? So not only are they used to affirm, but they also plant a seed of doubt in children's minds. Um, uh, which may resurface at a later date. Um, and I know that as an author, I go and I have, well, I did go into schools quite a lot with my books and you're treated like royalty. You're, you're the absolute star. They all squeal when you come in the classroom. Um, and they think you're really important. You know, you're, you're a really important person. You've written a real book, you know, with your name on and those words are really important and they put store by, by us authors. And I just think we need to be really careful what, 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 we're, um, what we're sending out to children. Um, so with My Body Is Me, I, I, um, I decided not to address this issue head on, but I, I, I tried to impart the message that I have always imparted to children in the 35 years that I've been working with children with a number of challenges. 
uh, which is, hey, look at you, you're great. Look at your body, it does all these interesting things. It holds your thoughts and your feelings and you understand the world through it. And, you know, um, it grows and it changes, but, you know, and you can dress it up in interesting costumes and, and act out scenarios physically. Uh, but you come back to yourself and you eat your tea and you, and you brush your teeth and, you know, you, um, you look after your body because you've only got one of it. I mean, it's a very, very basic message that we all need to remind ourselves of, not just children, we all need to remind ourselves of these things. So, and, you know, with Jessica's illustrations, they're just beautiful. I mean, she really understands children. She understands the physicality of children and the book is entirely inclusive. So it, um, it depicts children of all different body types or different abilities or different ethnicities uh, or different personalities and interests. And um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, and basically I wanted a book that kids liked, you know, and enjoyed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, something that's, that's directed towards children rather than yeah, a child centered book. A, a message. Yeah, yeah. So you really saw what was going on and, 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 and sort of positively wanted to, to produce an alternative that challenged gender stereotypes at the same time as um, encouraging children to feel comfortable in their bodies and what yeah. their bodies can yeah. do rather than what yeah. they look like. Yeah. Millie, you're, you're quite different really. I mean, I, I don't think you've published a book in response to anything, but you've published a book about periods for girls within a climate where, um, you know, I'm seeing um, uh, sex education providers uh, talk about menstruators and non-menstruators. So you must have been aware um, that the, the climate that you were publishing in, that your book was going to be uh, seen as controversial. Um, I think I was slightly aware, although perhaps the optimist in me was still thinking, you know, surely no one's going to notice if a period book is aimed at girls. <laughs> but um, I didn't write the book, like you say, I didn't write it with any kind of intention to, um, you know, make a, a statement. Um, certainly that wasn't uppermost. Um, what brought me to writing the book was, um, as you know, I'd already written two books about childbirth and I'd been on this wonderful workshop um, about menstruation um, with a woman from Australia called Jane Hardwick Collings um, that really got me thinking because what she does is she looks at the whole of women's lives um, and how they feel about their bodies and how the messages they're given about their bodies throughout their lives. Um, and she was talking about the messages that we, you know, give to children, young girls about periods and how they, you know, you take those with you into your pregnancy, into the birth room, because constantly it's being reinforced to women that there's something dysfunctional or disgusting or weird about their bodies. So I thought actually that's so interesting. Um, and then when I, it was locked down and I was asked to write a book um, for, if I'd be interested in doing a book for children about periods. And so I said, yes, because I thought that's, you know, it's a way to, to get positive messages into, you know, the, the hands of a nine-year-old girl rather than waiting until she's 30 and she's having her first baby to, to get her thinking about how, you know, like Rachel was saying, how interesting and how clever and how fantastic her body is and all the things that it does. So that was what brought me into it. But I did at the same time have on my radar, um, quite a bit on my radar, <laughs> what was going on with, um, the discussions around sex and gender, obviously, because being in the birth world, you know, the, the language was being changed and I was undecided for a while about how I felt about that and did a lot of reading and, and uh, listening to podcasts and that kind of thing. So by the time it came to writing the book about periods, I think I had made my mind up and I thought in particular, I was worried about the affirmation model. I used to be a therapist and I used to work with children as a therapist and I couldn't understand what was going on there. So I thought, Although this is ostensibly a book about periods, it is an opportunity to, um, you know, to talk to a generation of girls who are being given some quite, un, you know, uh, unsafe and bizarre messages about their bodies and gender stereotypes and all of that kind of stuff and kind of come at it slightly from a side angle, but just kind of drop in some positive messages about being a girl, basically, in an environment in which, you know, girls are some girls are making a decision that that's, you know, something that you, you, you want to identify out of. So, yeah. Um, I can't see, see you, Millie. Is your camera on? 
Oh, yes, it is. I can see myself. Oh, you can. OK, it's yeah. just me then. Um, it's really, it, you know, I think it's an important book because of period shaming and how girls are, are, are you know, that's a, quite a big issue that children, that girls, you know, following on from Rachel's book about being um, comfortable in your body and proud of your body and what it can do, that menstruation is, is a part of that for girls. Um, yeah. But... Um, what reaction did you get? I mean, when you um, wanted to publish it, did you get a lot of pushback about um, the fact that you'd written it for girls, you'd written it as a something that happens to females, and um, in this climate where we should be talking about boys can menstruate too, it's menstruators and non-menstruators, we don't use the word female or woman in relation to menstruation, and that was the environment that you were writing in? Well, the, the pushback um, came mainly during the writing process. So I think to begin with, um, like many people, the publishers kind of didn't notice, <laughs> don't do you, that this is a book about girls because they were just thinking, great, it's a period book, girls, women, great, da da da. And then something happened during the uh, writing process, the editing process um, that, what, I don't know what the right expression to use is kind of put the willies up them kind of thing. <laughs> they suddenly realize, oh, crikey, this is a book um, that's not inclusive um, in the sense that it's not talking, it's talking about girls having periods, like you say. So then commenced a kind of very long drawn out um, battle um, between me and the publishers. By that time, um, it, there was an overlap if people know my story of how I was kind of bullied out of the birth world that bullying happened in um during the time I was actually writing the book so 2020 kind of the end of 2020 was when everything exploded for me in, in online um and I was attacked for you know questioning the term birthing people um and that was one of the reasons why that was so terrifying for me because my, I was still in the process of doing the, writing the period book and it was still in edits at that time so I I thought if the publishers found out about what happened they would perhaps just drop the book so there was that kind of overlap so I, that's why I kept my head down for as long as I did one of the reasons I kept my head down for as long as I did it was this time last year that I told my story and by the time I told my story the book was in the bag and I but during that <laughs> overlap time sorry it's quite a convoluted story but during that mm. overlap time there was this um battle once the publishers realized that there was no mention of trans boys having periods or anything they did try to even though the book had already gone to layouts so it was already ready to go to the printers they then tried to get me to change bits of it and I said no and so it was kind of a rock hard place situation for everybody it was a bit of a Mexican standoff um because it was difficult at that point for them to get rid of me basically because I'd already finished the book and it was already at layouts. So that was kind of a very difficult time. It was um, very stressful. Um, I was offered my, my um, advance back, um, which wasn't a huge amount of money. So that would have meant I'd done basically a year's work for 4,000 pounds, which was what the advance was. Um, and I said, no, um, I wanted the book. I wanted to see the book over the line. So it really was a kind of locked horns situation um some people know they might have read that uh, the they suggested sensitivity readers and the first people they suggested were the school of sexuality education who some people may be aware of um and certainly they were involved in the recent um family sex show so that was kind of like how bad it got really <laughs> and um it was really a, it was me it was it was unfortunate in a way for the publishers that they couldn't really get rid of me at that point. So it was, uh, and I don't want to say, I don't, I don't really like talking too negatively about them in an online, you know, in a public situation, because I do appreciate that there was lots of different voices going on at their end and different, it, I, yeah, I'm not trying to sort of say that the entire publishers were, there was definitely something going on that was trying to, uh, they were, they were panicking basically. And I think that's what happens in this environment is people think this is, you know, this is going to be a problem. And I said to them, it, the more you try to make this book inclusive and put in silly extra paragraphs, the more people are going to screenshot things, put them on Twitter and get into a bun fight over it. Be strong. Leave it as a book for girls. That makes it incredibly difficult. Who, who can go on Twitter and say, I've just found this period book and all it talks about is girls. They're just going to look like an idiot. So that was my line to them. I just said, just hold the line and just put publish it. It's a book for girls about periods, for goodness sake. 
but <laughs> it, it's just interesting that that can be controversial and and actually what you just said then leads us nicely into um my next question which is what was the um reaction to your book and rachel if you if you'd like to go first on this question uh because you wrote a very body positive lovely um book for children who could possibly complain oh well um yeah who would have thought that 284 words of um, some of which are repeating would uh of basically light verse <laughs> could cause such a stir i mean um it's kind of accidental genius i think really that um that highlights the craziness of gender activism that people really came down on this book. So initially, within a couple of days of it being announced, um, there was uh, a tweet that went viral from somebody who's now, I think, suspended, some troll, uh, saying, describing it as terrorist propaganda. And uh, this went twice around the world and was picked up by Pink News. And the result of that was that I got lots of abusive emails through my website, uh, quite quite aggressive, uh, violent stuff, and also in my DMs. So that was my first introduction, but I was, I was kind of braced for some of that. I'd seen enough to know. Uh, what, what really shocked me was the industry publishing, children's publishing industry result, uh, response. So, a cohort of authors, probably around 20, but a core of about six or seven, um, basically conducted a smear campaign on me publicly online, calling me vile and hateful and bigoted and obviously transphobic and that I had a hateful worldview and that I was likened to Tommy Robinson. These are, these are all published authors who are allegedly respected, uh, authors, librarians, illustrators. Um, uh, so they, they, uh, my, my, the agency that, that gets me into schools, the one who I earn my money through was contacted and they said, you know, should this woman be working in schools with her dangerous ideology? I mean, I've worked for 35 years as a special needs teacher with most vulnerable children. So, you know, this was pretty insulting. Um, they were quite performative in that they would remove, say, oh, well, I'm removing this book from the shelf because it's ableist, a kid in my class, you know. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it, it was, it was, it was uh, an onslaught for, for a long time uh, and actually is still going on. So um, I contacted the Society of Authors because they're my union uh, I wasn't that hopeful because I know that I'd written to them six months earlier because they'd misrepresented the Equality Act. They'd, they'd replaced sex with gender identity or gender or both or. And so I kind of knew which side they were on. And also I have to say that some of the committee members of the Society Authors were actually retweeting the defamation about transgender trend and, and you know, about me essentially. So. Uh, and they kind of framed it as author disputes. Uh, we can't get involved in author disputes. But the thing is, is that I wasn't disputing anything. Um, in fact, all these slurs and, and defamation about me was done from behind a block. So I couldn't even respond to them. And, and I didn't even name them publicly either. You know, I was quite controlled in, in, in how I responded. So there was that. And then there was the behind the scenes stuff from... Uh, well, I'll just say from people who um, had positions of responsibility over my career. So my social media was monitored and they would screenshot my tweets, which I've got an open timeline. Anyone can read my tweets. Uh, I stand by them. I was told that I had to or that I should remove any uh, support for change under trend um, in my tweets, which I didn't. I was told that I had to uh, or that I should. Um, remove the tweets that questioned the valid validity of drag time story in school, in, in, in libraries. I didn't take that one down either. Um, um, I contacted a couple of publishers because a couple of authors had 
said real outright lies about me. So I contacted a couple of publishers to say, can you please ask them to take that extreme lie down about me? Uh, one didn't answer me, even though I contacted them three times. The other one kind of fluffed it a little bit. So, um, uh, I had quite a few authors contact me privately and say that they agree with me, but you know, they've got mortgages and young children. Uh, most people just generally whistled and turned away. They, everyone saw what was going on, but I, I think only two or three people actually came to my defense, uh, you know, and individual comments and they were slammed down very suddenly. I got a lovely DM exchange from JK Rowling. So that was good. Um, uh, and some people just carried on supporting my work that is totally unrelated to this issue, my poetry and my picture books um, as normal, which was great, you know? Uh, I think one of the most painful things was um, the fact that people that I'd worked with for 10 years and who championed my work, um, and I was very, very well-respected children's poet, you know, probably one of the top, considered one of the top female children's poets, um, totally dropped me. So, so my last book, Hey Girl, which I really like and is my most personal um, uh, collection, was totally ignored. Given the fact that my three previous books have all been shortlisted or award-winning, it was kind of significant, but, you know, it was obvious in the fact that nobody touched it, you know. Um, well, very few people did, some, some people did, but generally, even friends said they didn't dare like or retweet about mm -hmm. my books that were totally unrelated because they were frightened that they would get attacked. So, it, but, yeah. yeah. It was really shocking to watch. It was like a sustained and directed campaign against you to make you lose your job and your livelihood, which the children's book publishing ind industry colluded with um, and didn't stop. Um, and it, it was um, the way that you say that you were then ignored is another sort of hidden way, I think, that the silencing happens. That I don't you're... like cancel culture, it's ghosting mm. culture. It's very, mm. very powerful. What about you, Millie? What, what reaction has there been to your book? Because we know that parents are so grateful to have these books. And some of it, you know, so what we get is overwhelmingly positive. And what about your book? Yeah, I mean, it's had um, a very positive um, reception, lots of uh, five star reviews on Amazon, and there hasn't been really any negativity about it. Um, the negativity that I've experienced in the past year or so has been about me rather than about the book. Maybe it's difficult for them to find fault with the book because it is just a really nice book for kids about periods. Um, so, yeah, I've had, um, you know, I've been made unwelcome really in the world that I was part of before I talked about my my gender critical views um the world of maternity and that has had an impact on my income um I'm not asked to speak at events anymore and I was doing sort of one a month before the pandemic um and I have been deplatformed from a big conference in New Zealand um in the last year and also there was an event which was going to be online with Freddie McConnell um and uh, he objected to speaking alongside of me, so that got cancelled as well. Um, and I think, you know, it's it, when you're self-employed, it's difficult, and Rachel knows this as well, it's difficult to measure the impact of these things because you don't know what would have happened if you hadn't said what you said. But, I mean, certainly I've seen it play out that people have shared, say, an Instagram post saying, oh, this is a really brilliant book, not necessarily about my period, but about any of my books. And then they'll be contacted and told, you could, or, or there'll be comments underneath saying, you shouldn't buy this book, she's a transphobe. So then you don't know how many people are thinking, oh, I really like that book, but I'm not gonna post anything about it. And so it's a very, very sort of slow drip effect, but I think it has, you know, it has had an, I'd be, I'd be lying if I didn't say it had a negative impact on my livelihood, but I just still feel that I've done the right thing because well, I've been on it. I was going to move on to that question. So do you regret? Uh, speaking your views um publishing the book no no I don't um it's no basically <laughs> short answer right right <laughs> and Rachel what about you because you've well, had the, that's the biggest impact yeah. on your life and your life yeah life. I mean uh I'm I'm very proud of the book I stand by it I stand by my behavior online 
Um, I won't be socially shamed by anybody. Um, ethically, as a teacher, as, as a parent, uh, ethically, professionally, personally, I know I've done the right thing. I know I'm right, you know? Sorry, but I do. Um, uh, I've lost, every, you know, I've lost everything. I've lost my career. I haven't written since. Um, it's had a big effect on my mental health. It's continued throughout lockdown. You know, the whole thing has not stopped. But, you know, for me, I've, I've lost respect for the industry, an industry that is become coward. And um, I mean, not, not individual people, but collectively, I've lost respect for the industry. Um, uh, this kind of atmosphere is not good for publishing. It's not good for literature and it's not good for children. Uh, but I, ha I want to say, on the positive, you know, I was probably the first in children's publishing to to nail my colours to the mask pre JK, you know, and um, I don't think this has happened now again. I don't think I think people are waking up. People are reading articles. They're looking beyond the mantras. They're looking beyond the clickbait headlines. You know, they are realizing what's happening to children. They are realizing what is happening within the industry and and who the agitators are and you know, I am going to carry on speaking out and do my best to ensure that this never happens to another children's author. And, uh, you know, what you say, though, is really, it takes me back to Herb and Michelle, the, the first people to speak out take the hit. And you've certainly taken the hit for in children's publishing industry. And I'm sure that you've made the path easier for those who follow, yeah, which I'm sure they hopefully. will. That's my um, aim. Thank you so much. Thank you so much both of you Thank for you. coming on. I would just like to show, this is um, Sex and Gender. This is Rachel's uh, and Jessica Albo's lovely book. It, it's so beautiful. It's such top quality. The words and the illustrations, um, just such a, a lovely book. And the feedback from children, yeah. they love it. They, they remember it. They go around singing it. And Millie's book, My Period, it's just, again, such a lovely quality book. It makes me, you know, I know about menstruation, but I really, really want to read this book, the way it's, it's laid out. It's, I really love the quality of, of, of the books that's being, being produced. And I'm so grateful to you for coming on and for speaking to us. Um, and some of that's quite difficult stuff to share. So thank you for doing it, Rachel. Thank you for being the first and the pioneer in, in children's book publishing industry. So many people are grateful to you for doing that. And Millie, thank you for holding on and not giving in and uh, sticking by your principles for your book um, and speaking out. Next section, we'll be speaking to Dr. Az Hakim and to Sue and Marcus Evans about the books that they've produced for um, clinical professionals. Thank you. Thank you.